All right, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Fridays with Fiscal. Today, we're going to be covering the topic of uh, USPS and EMIS connections, so how the two work together. Um, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, again, before we get started, I want to ask everybody, please make sure if you're not already muted to mute yourself. Um, if you have a question, you can go ahead and unmute yourself. That's fine. Or you can send a message in the chat. Either way, I'm going to kind of try to keep an eye on, on that as well. So we will go ahead and get started. So the first thing that we have to do is talk about like where all of the data is coming from for the EMIS reporting when the SIP data collector pulls the data. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> excuse me. So a lot of times we talk about um, CI records or CK records or CJ records. Those are like the record names for the EMIS side. But on our side, basically what, the, what that pulls in, like the CI records basically consist of anything that's pulled from attendance in the payroll, anything from the employee records, and then um, also on the employee records, there's, there's certain fields like years of experience, long-term illness, all of that information is pulled in using the data collector. Um, we're gonna talk about kind of like break it down individually as far as like each different record type. Um, another thing I wanted to tell you about as well is if you wanted to find out more information regarding like which records are pulled in at what time and what fields on the screens are actually used, um, I have a PowerPoint that I just put out um, on our documentation page. Um, it's just, um, it's called USPS EMIS and it actually has a link to a, a PowerPoint, and it, that PowerPoint pretty much explains everything, like where you know where certain fields are located. Um, let me go ahead and pull it up so you guys can actually see what it looks like. You get it here. So it's just out on the wiki underneath that USPS our documentation page. And then I just actually added a USPS and EMIS connection link. So if you click on that, you'll see that there's an actual link to the PowerPoint. And this is what the PowerPoint looks like. And we can kind of go, I'll just kind of scan through real quick, but we're gonna go through each thing. So basically it's telling you which screens report what. So again, there's like many different screens on the payroll side, and each of those screens play a part in the SIP data collector, what gets pulled in. Um, the, and then Lori, the yes? Lori, I'm sorry to interrupt, but um, we, I have some coworkers that say they're waiting in a waiting room to get into the meeting. A waiting room, okay, hold on. Let me look here, I don't, I don't see anything on a waiting room. Hold on, let me go through, because there is something on my thing that says admit. And yeah, no Lori, go to admit. participants, and then you'll see them in your waiting room, and then you can admit them. Yeah, that's right. I'm, I see them, and that, okay, hold on. I want to make sure I got everybody in. Okay. I do not hear any sound. Okay, Deb Meyer. I want to make sure we can have a I'm in. Here. I'm in now, but I had to um, recall. I had to call in again to get to sound. Okay, so now you're in. Okay. I am, Let's but my coworker's go. also in the waiting room. Okay, hold on here. I'm I'm in now. Deb. Hi, everyone. Everybody. Okay. Morning, everyone. Um, okay. Yeah, it looks like everybody is in. If not, I mean, if you're around someone that says they're not in, let me know. But I think I have everybody admitted in, so. Okay. All right, sorry about that. I'm glad you mentioned that, thank you. Okay, so um, anyway, here, like here's an employee, a, shot, a screenshot of an employee record, and you can see that I have stars. These are fields that are all basically used for EMIS reporting. Um, so when you have time, you can go out and look at the PowerPoint. I'm not going to go through each field with you, but um, you'll you'll notice that we have those highlighted with these, these stars. 
so you know which fields get pulled in. Um, okay, whoever, I, I'm getting some feedback. Can you mute your phone, please? Okay. So that, again, we have some more employee data that's pulled in as well. And some more employee information. There's a lot of information off the employee record that gets pulled in. And then we have employee notes. So basically, who and what do I report to EMIS? So there is an EMIS manual, and that can be found on the ODU webpage. We also, I also have it pulled up here, but on page one through 12 of the EMIS staff demographics, CI record guide, it explains to you in great detail, like who should be reported. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and pull up that EMIS manual. And all the staff information is found in chapter three, which is down here under the uh, staff records. So again, I was talking about the staff demographic record. So the staff demographic record pertains to all the information pulled from the employee record or attendance information. So if I wanted to look at just the staff demographic information, I would go to that fiscal year 20, the 6.1 version. And this explains to me everything that ODE expects for the staff demographic information. And I have this in the PowerPoint so you know, but on the very, like the very first page before it starts, they have a record collections um, request and it gives you the record field numbers for EMIS and then the data element as well as like what reporting window it's, it's expected to be reported in. So here you can see all these, uh, these field numbers and this is really helpful when you're uh, processing the data collector and maybe your EMIS coordinator says, hey, there's errors. Well, they're getting a C1280 error or a C1330 error. And you're like, what does that mean? Here over here, it explains C1130 is principal years of experience. So that kind of guides you on where you need to look, what you need to correct to get that data uh, process right. And then over here, it tells you when those, what windows that data needs to be reported in. So you can see here the initial L, there's not a lot of data, just the absence information, attendance information, all of that gets reported in the last window, which is usually like June, July, whenever uh, OD has that last window, which you can see over here. But almost everything pretty much gets reported in the initial window, which is at the beginning of the fiscal year. And then the other data all gets, everything gets reported in the last window. So again, this is where you can, you can uh, point your, your district users on the payroll side. Hey, if you wanna, you know, you could print this off so you know what record field numbers are, are it's basically telling you the error is on. That will help guide them to what they need to correct. Um, let's go back to the PowerPoint here. So, Again, you can look at that. I did put the link for the, uh, the EMIS manual in the PowerPoint. And then another thing that gets reported and we also need to talk about are the long-term illness days. Um, long-term illness days are 15 or more consecutive work days that an employee is absent. So if an employee is absent for 15 or more days, the district has to make sure that they go into the employee record and in the long-term illness field, they're gonna to have to make sure, I'll go ahead and pull up that record. They're gonna to have to make sure that they populate that long-term illness field with, with the number of days that they were absent. Right here's that long-term illness field. <clears throat> so with that being said, um, one thing that districts need to be aware of is the 15 consecutive work days whether it's a, a paid or unpaid during their absence, those need to be reported. If for some reason the employee was granted some sort of a medical leave, that is not considered long-term illness, so that would not get reported to EMIS for the fiscal year. All right, then we also have another very important thing, which is the reporting of the years of experience. Now, as as you know, on the uh, employee record, there are several different types of experience that you can that the district can track. 
But the three main ones that are reportable to EMIS are the authorized years, the principal years, and the total years of experience. So like your authorized years of experience basically are if uh, the teacher has experience as a regular or a substitute teacher in, in, any, in an elementary or secondary um, uh, the location, and they, have, they worked at least 120 days in the regular school year, so basically at the end of the fiscal year. Um, you are going to include anything as far as teaching in a college, a university, or any other items such as that. That is your authorized years of experience. Now, your principal years of experience would only affect anyone that is certified to be a principal or an assistant principal. Those would actually be, um, are, are, they would be tracked just as, or excuse me, as, as the principal years of experience that would be entered on, let's say, a principal's employee record in the principal years of experience. That information needs to be tracked. And then your total years of experience is all Certi uh, certificated educational service. So whether it's authorized or non-authorized, total years of teaching experience, that needs to be populated on the employee record as well. And I will go back to the employee record so you can see where those fields are at. <clears throat> so down here, we should we have an experience section, if I can find it. Or I can just search for it. There we go. The experience section. So again, authorized, total, and principal. Those are the only three that need to be reported for EMIS reporting purposes. If the district wants to track building experience or other experience, they can definitely do that. But the only three we need are the total, authorized, and principal. Um, again, I kind of just already showed you this. I kind of jumped ahead of myself, but this is like that uh, demographic CI record information as far as like the, the record ID and when they're reportable, when the uh, elements are reportable. And then um, the position is an employment record. Those are considered CK records. Okay, so anything with position or compensation would be pulled in using basically on EMIS terms, but that is a CK record, that is an employment record. And in, in this PowerPoint, I have the information, like all of the different information that, that gets pulled, that gets used for the EMIS reporting. And you can see as well, I have screenshots of the different screen, like the position screen. And again, I have stars next to the fields that are used for EMIS reporting. And the, here's some more of the position record as well. Um, here, there's a couple little notes, um, which you guys already know, but you know, if you have a new district user, you may want to point that out to them. Um, there is a drop down option under most, most um, anything that contains a lot of data, like your position code, your status code, all of that information has drop down boxes, so it's easier for them to be able to choose which position code or uh, uh, assignment area they, they basically are going to be using to report to that, that employee. So you just kind of want to remember to, to tell the employees, hey, there are drop downs, it is beneficial for you to use those. And then <clears throat> here are some screenshots of your compensation records. And again, I have stars next to all the fields that are basically reportable to EMIS. So those fields need to be populated in order for the EMIS data to be pulled in correctly. Um, <clears throat> one thing that the district will want to keep in mind is the, the contract, uh, the salary amount, um, the rate is, is a calculated field. So basically, they, there's some calculations that are done um, if the rate, the amount, the amount, <laughs> excuse me, amount divided by the rate, it actually uses that information on the MIS side to calculate the, the total uh, amount, the payable amount to the employee. Um, and then again, um, in the MIS manual, I have I've referred to it, we have, there, 
uh, page 15. That basically talks about all the CK information um, as far as like the employment information for the employees, but what's reportable, what's not, um, all the different elements, all the different um, related numbers, like the CK, right, CK numbers that go with each of the elements, that's, that's all in this information as well. Um, another question that districts may have, especially the ESCs or a regular district, how do I report extended service time? Extended service days is normally required for ESC, but if a local district has extended service days, they normally just incorporate those in the number of work days the employee has. Um, there's an actual extended service field that the, that the ESC can actually enter in those extended service days for that employee right on that field in the compensation record. <clears throat> um, the hours per day should not include lunches because that, again, is one of the reportable fields to EMIS. So the district will want to make sure that they're not including, including lunchtime as, as part of the hours per day. Um, another reportable field is the FTE, which is the full-time equivalent, equivalency, I should say. So that basically, the, the full-time equivalency is a ratio. It's between like the amount of time that it normally takes for that job to, to be performed and like a part-time job, what that would normally be. So example would be, you have a teaching position. The teaching position, let's just say, is six hours is the normal, the normal amount of a day for the performance of that job. So if that person has six hours, they're going to have one FTE, one full-time equivalency, because that's the amount of time it takes for that job to be performed. But you also have a part-time teacher. She only works three hours a day. Okay, well, half the, the six is three, so she's going to only get 0.5 FTE because she's only doing half of the time that it takes to perform that position. So districts just need to be aware of that. Need, they need to make sure that they know that. And here is basically that example that I just talked to you about. Um, another thing that a lot of times districts will do, whoops, hold on here, is they will create dummy um, jobs for basically only for EMIS reporting. They don't pay on the job. They just create them for EMIS reporting. And the reason they do that is because an employee may, may work multiple jobs. I mean, they may have one position that you're paying them on, but maybe they work, you know, three or four different, like split up positions. So maybe one of the jobs is, is 0.5 FTE and the other one is 0.5 FTE. And there's another one that was 0.5 FTE. Those can all be, report, those can all be basically reported for EMIS purposes. And like I said, a dummy job is just created, or dummy compensation record is just created. So be position rec or uh, yeah, compensation record for that particular employee. Um, but then they just pay them on the one, the one job. Okay. Um, and then again, we have I put a screenshot of the um, employment staff record, the CK information as far as EMIS reporting goes, as far as your record field numbers, your elements. And what, what reporting cycle those, those elements are basically pulled into. Uh, one thing to keep in mind, we do have uh, the position code. Um, anyone that has like your 800 position code, like your supplementals, those can be reported in the initial and the final. They're only required to be reported in the final uh, window. Just, just an FYI so you know that and your districts know that as well. Um, then we have the CC records, and the CC records are basically pulled in for contract-only staff records, and so those are reported during the initial window as well as the final window, uh, the L window. Um, the guidelines for reporting CC records basically is um, the record is for reporting of the staff that are contracted from a non-EMIS reporting entity. 
So a lot of districts, maybe they hire a, a, a third party for transportation or custodial or food services. Those type of goods, that, that needs to be reported using the CC records. Now, the CC records can be found, let me go back to my instance here. We'll kind of talk about this a little bit. If you go to core under this EMIS entry option, we have we have the uh, employment, the employee. We also have CC records as well. Now, if you you have an EMIS coordinator, because like in classic, they used to have um, a, a permission that would allow them to go into the web and they could actually enter in just EMIS information for the employees that you know for the the staff that they needed to add in. And this EMIS entry record is like the same as that was in Classic because they have the ability to enter in EMIS employee information. And you can see they only have the capability of going in and doing a modify. They can't go in and actually add an employee. That's not part of their job. They can do modifications just like they could in Classic to an employee record. So if I just go into modify, I could go in and I could make a modification to an employee's record. And you'll see there's a lot of fields that are grayed out. They don't have any access to those at all. But there are fields that they do have the capability of going in and actually changing. And yet again, you'll notice that all they have capability of doing is viewing and, and, and modifying, no adding. And then we have the same thing for the EMIS position entry. So again, same as in classic, they have the capability of going in and, and modifying or viewing information regarding the employee's position information. You know, position code, maybe they need to change that. They could do that. <clears throat> the next option is the EMIS contract with service, which we were just talking about um, as far as like entering information in for a contract with service. If you, the payroll person does that, that's great. If not, the MIS person can do it if they're granted the appropriate role. Because normally uh, uh, that particular role needs to be granted to that EMIS person in order for them to be able to only see the MIS entry screens. Maybe you don't want them seeing everything else, just these screens. There's a role that will allow them to do that. So I clicked on the CC record here. If I go into the create option, you can see that I have to, I can create the information regarding the contract building staff record. Um, it asks for like the, the federal ID, position code, funding source, um, all that information. You'll notice down here it has based on people, based on service, based on hours. If you're reporting like multiple people, you could actually go in and you could put in, you know, if you're, if, if you're, you've employed 15 people from this contractor, you could go in and you could put that information in. Um, you'd have to tell it yes, or you're basing it on people. And then um, basing it on service, you could say no. And then the hours, what you would have to do is you would have to calculate all 15 of those people's hours. And then you would put that, that figure into the, the uh, hold on, I messed that up, I'm sorry. It's asking you whether you're basing it on hours, service, or people. And then um, here's the hours per week. I'm sorry. That's where you, if, you, if you're basing it on hours, you're going to total up all the hours for the, uh, the employees, and you're going to put that information here. Um, the rate, it would be the total amount for all those employees that you're reporting. If you're basing it on people, um, you're going to go ahead and you're going to add all that up, and you're going to put that in as the total dollar amount. So you could do it by one or you could do it by many. It's up to you. Um, what's the other option you have in here? Let me get out of here and minimize that. Okay. The other option you have is once you get those records created, you actually can create an extraction of the CC data that you have pulled out there. And all you have to do is click on the extract CC data option. And when you do that, it's going to create 
that extract file for you, which you can either have, if, you know, if you're, if you're, if you're, if you're a payroll person actually does the uploading of the data for EMIS, then they can actually upload the file into EMIS. If they don't, then they could take that file and they could send it to their EMIS coordinator who in turn would actually pull that into the data collector. So here's my CC extract that I just created, the information on that record. And like I said, they're gonna save that file to their desktop or wherever they wanna save it. And then they're gonna actually either upload it or they're going to send it to their EMIS coordinator, however that district handles that information. Another option in the uh, EMIS entry is the CJ record, which the CJ records are basically, again, reportable on the initial window as well as the final L window. So they have to be reported both reporting periods. And then the guidelines for the CJ record is, is pretty much um, requiring you have to report each contractor for each staff member, for, member providing service or keeping a course. Uh, a lot of times the contractor could be an ESC. Uh, they must be an EMIS reportable entity. And the term contract, it refers to an agreement with another entity. Uh, the, the term contractor um, is uh, refers to the entity with which the resident educating district is contracting. So the resident educating district at this point does not report a staff demographic, a staff employment, or a contract uh, staff employment CJ record for the contracting staff. But if they're contracting with the ESC or another EMIS reporting entity, then um, if Hold on here, what did I say? What did I just say? <laughs> uh, the resident district does not report a staff, okay. Is there a contract? Yeah, if they're contracted with an ESC or EMIS, they don't have to report a CJ record. Now, if the resident district is contracted with a non-EMIS reporting entry, they do not report the record. Instead, they just report a, uh, either a contract only, a CC record, or they could report a staff demographic record and a staff employment record for the employee. Uh, a contractor staff record is only reported by the contractor. So if an ESB is your contractor, they're the ones that are reporting the CJ record, not the, re the educating district or the, the resident district. So just keep that in mind. Um, and again, in the, in the EMIS manual, there are, there's a chapter on CC records and a chapter on CJ records, and that thoroughly explains everything as far as like what needs to be reported, how it needs to be reported, what they can do to pull that information in. But as you can see right now, I have no capability of creating or doing anything with the CJ record. Um, in order to do that, I have to go in, uh, I think it's modules. There's a module. And, which is called EMIS contractor module. I have to turn that module on. So if you have an ESC and they have to create a CJ record, that, that EMIS contractor module has to be turned on. Then if I go back to the EMIS entry option, I should be able to see that CJ record tab at the top. It'll be, it should be visible to me now. And it is, here's the EMIS, con nope. EMIS Contractor CJ tab. So if I click on that tab, again, it allows me to pull up and create a CJ record. And the information I put, I put in is the employee information, the position, pull in the compensation, the IRN, the position code of the FTE. And when I save that information, I could actually then go in and you'll see again, we have an extract CJ data tab. It'll do the same thing that we do with the CC. If you could actually create an extraction of the CJ data for pulling into the EMIS uh, data collector, or you can actually set it to your EMIS coordinator, however the districts handle that information. So here's my CJ record. Maybe. Oh, there's nothing on it. That's not good. 
<clears throat> but again, you can create the CC records, you can create CJ records just by going to that EMIS entry option. All right, so let's go back to the PowerPoint again. Now kind of scroll through this a little bit. Um, so here's a little bit, we'll talk about the data collector. Uh, when the data collection is performed on the staff data, the local contract code, because we've had this question a few times, is an alpha character. And it's going to show on the lo local contract code as a reference to the CK record. Okay. Now, um, in redesign, each compensation that's reportable under to the EMIS uh, data collector is reported separately within the position collection. So the local contract code um, is going to be set to position a position number. And then the alpha character may follow. So if they have like more than one uh, record, it's going to be like uh, 1A, 1B. You're going to see that information in the data collector instead of just like 1, 2, 3, like you probably would have seen with classic. Because in here, you have the position record, but you might have multiple compensations. So you might have. Uh, one position job, job or position one, but two different compensations associated with that. So both of those will get reported with contractor code. Um, the information we just talked about was it's set up inside the soap service bridge and it's used to gather the information. So there's like nothing that the district has to do as far as that goes, as far as that um, information that gets pulled in uh, because it all pulls in based on the uh, EMIS soap bridge takes care of assigning those compensations with the uh, the codes appropriately. Uh, the local uh, contract code is displayed and shows the code that was assigned during the collection. Again, we talked about the local contract, the code, which gets pulled in using that uh, the, the EMIS soap bridge. Um, and we talked about this a minute ago. If there are two reportable compensations for the same position, the local codes would be 1A and 1B. And then um, in the PowerPoint, again, I actually pulled in the, the CC information as far as like the, the, the CC reference numbers for the different fields, the different elements that it pulls in. And you can see on this one, I just basically pulled this in. This is basically the file record layout, but they didn't really have like a layout like they did for the CI and CK as far as like what you know reporting periods they're they're doing and that so i just pulled this information because the the uh the record numbers is kind of important a lot of times especially when they're looking for errors they can look at the error that they're getting and it says cc060 okay well then they know it's a contractor name error so that's why i pulled that information in and then we've got the cj records which we already kind of talked about and again, um, go down here, and we do, I pulled in again, the, uh, the information for the CJ records as far as the, the, the CC or CJ number that associates with the elements on the payroll side. And you can see again, this is a layout of the record, but they didn't have the reporting periods. But like I talked about earlier, CC and CJ records are reportable during the initial and the final reporting period. Um, the data collector chooses the staff data to process, the staff CI, the, the CK records, it pulls all that information in. If the CC and CJ records import files into MIS is necessary, you're gonna have to basically, I think on the data collector, they actually have to tell us their, you know, which data they're pulling in, but, um, they can actually import those files in and then pull that data into the data collector if they if they choose. Um, the EMIS manual again um, on the OD website. Here's a link to that to that uh, document or that booklet, I should say. And then again, we talked about section three is all staff record data elements. So that's all the staff information. And then they have we have an online checklist that you guys can follow. This is kind of like for the new fiscal year, and I'm kind of going to go over that a little bit. Um, you can find that, 
of the SWAT to the, uh, the wiki because it's out on the wiki in our documentation. Go back to it here. I had it pulled up. Where did it go? Over here. Okay, so I go to the user manual. And I think I'm going to put some of this stuff around. I just put this USPS out there, but I kind of want to put the EMIS checklist with the USPS stuff. And I didn't have time this morning, so I will get that kind of switched around. But under checklist, under the appendix right now, is where that EMIS checklist is located. So we'll kind of go ahead and we'll talk about this a little bit. Um, this is for new fiscal year information. So like at the beginning of next fiscal year, they're going to actually, they can actually follow this checklist. Um, we'll kind of go through this a little bit and we'll talk about uh, each of these bullet points. So the first thing they're going to do after fiscal year 19 or fiscal year 20 is completed, they're going to actually have to go in and update the MIS configuration fiscal year. And how they can do that is they go to system configuration. And then they go down to the EMIS reporting configuration field or option. And you'll see here that they have the capability of changing the fiscal year to 2021 and then saving it. Now, they're not going to want to do anything with this. You can see um, this is kind of grayed out that they shouldn't really be able to change it because that's how they're reporting to EMIS right now. They're using credential ID in this instance. Um, they don't want to mess with that. They don't want to change that. And then we have a ZID prefix, which is what is used to create the ZID for non-certificated employees. So like any time um, a new classified employee is put in, if they run a data collection, it's using that prefix, the E57 or whatever your district prefix is. It's using that information and then adding on the remaining numbers to that employee's ZID. So that's where we're going to change the, uh, the configuration for the fiscal year. All right. Um, and then we talked about the CC and CJ records already. So again, next fiscal year, if they need to report CC and CJ records, they're going to be using that EMIS entry screen to enter that information in. And then if they need to create extract files, they can do that as well. Um, another option they're going to be doing is um, because we're in the new fiscal year, anyone that was reported with long term illness from the prior fiscal year, which would be 20. They're going to want to basically get rid of all that all that uh, information off of the long term illness field. So how they can do that, we do have a mass change option out there and under the employees uh, records on um, employee screen. So I'll go out to the core option and go to employees. Okay. And I, what I can do, I already have long-term illness pulled up here on my grid. If you, if they don't, you know, they could do that. They could pull up on their grid, and then I could filter the long-term illness because I want to get rid of everything. I want to get rid of anybody that has anything entered in the long-term illness. So I could do anything greater than one, and then it should filter only the people that have something in the long-term illness field, which it did. So I have two people that have long-term illness days that were first from last fiscal year. Well, I got to get rid of them. I want to get rid of them. So I'm going to use the mass change option in employees. I can use that. And under the low definition option, we do have a clear employee long-term illness, which has the SSDP in parentheses. That is actually something that is out there for everybody. Everyone should be able to see that. So I've got that pulled up. I've got that I'm in the maintenance mode right now that I want to execute because I want to basically get rid of the long-term illness for Schroeder and Howard. So I'm going to go ahead and hit the execution button. And then if I click the submit match change option, it told me two employee objects were updated. So now I can go up here, close this out. I'm going to pull up Schroeder and Howard. Nick's right here. He's my first one. 
You can see his long-term illness now has changed to zero. Now, if I really just wanted to do it to double check it overall, I could just do a filter and just do greater than one <coughs> to make sure <coughs> there's nothing there and there isn't. So basically that means that I cleared out all of my long-term illness information from fiscal year 20. So that's done. Okay. Now, another, uh, another thing that has to be done is the incrementing years of experience. Now, we do have a, um, <clears throat> excuse me, an option to do that. Um, I don't believe this is an SSD, <clears throat> excuse me, an SSDT option, but um, I don't remember if I put this out there or not. We do have an area that you can actually go out and see. We do have a few mass change definitions out there. And let me show you where that is at. Go in here. Um, you might as well look it up and make sure. Because if it's not out there, I will put it in. Uh, let me go to the wiki again. Maybe. Let's go. And we're down here. Where are you? Bear with me. I haven't done, gone to this for a while. It's here, I think. I'm going to state software in here, committee. But let me double check. Because it may not be. Uh, nope, 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 nope. I can't remember where it was at. Hold on. <laughs> I want to, it, it's something I don't go out to it that often. And all right. Nope, that's not it. <clears throat> well, I may have to just send you the information where it's at. But again, where are you in the world? Hold on. Not under there. Redesign. Yes. Redesign. There we go. I think I found. I think I found it. No. 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 I didn't. Yes, I did. Hold on. No, this is not Okay. I am sorry. I apologize. I should have looked this up before, but it just came to my mind as we were doing this. So I will send everybody the information, like where we have. Um, like I said, we do have a few mass change options out there, not many, but um, I will send you the link for that. But uh, I will actually go back in and show you now how we can actually update the years of experience using the mass change speaker. So first of all, I'm back on the employee record because that's where our years of experience are at. Now, one thing to keep in mind, the, the uh, mass change definition that I'm going to be using it's only changing the total years and the authorized years because not everyone is a principal. So we don't want to increase everyone's principal years of experience. And normally there's not that many principals within a district. So what they could do is just manually go in and do that. Or if you, they want to, or if you want to at the ITC, you could create another um, uh, mass change definition with just principal years of experience to do that if you prefer. It doesn't matter because all you'd have to do is filter for anybody that has greater than one principal years of experience and then they would load that information in. But this one that I'm going to be using only affects the authorized and the total years of experience. So what I want to do is I want to make sure I'm going to filter my data. So I want anybody that has anything, any authorized experience greater than one and total experience greater than one. I'm going to pull in that information. I think. I thought. Okay, hold on here. Let's go back. <clears throat> all right. So I've got all of my employees then that have authorized or total use of experience greater than one. So what I'm going to do is click on the mass change tab. And then under here, I actually already loaded this increment experience definition that I have out there. 
So what I'm going to do, hold on, let me go back to my notes because I want you to actually be able to see what it's doing. It's actually adding one year of authorized experience and one year of total years of experience. That's what it looks like in the maintenance option. So I'm going to go to the execution option. And when I do that, it's going to tell me there's 150 employees of them that are going to be modified. And let's just take a look. Let's look at some, let's look at Nick Schroeder. He's got 11 authorized and five total right now. So I'm going to go ahead and do the submit mass change option. So Nick should change to 12 and 6. Okay, <clears throat> and we'll go ahead and close this. And you can see Nick Schroeder, he changed to 12 authorized years and six total years of experience. So that's a really fast way for them to be able to do the years of experience now. Uh, previously, we didn't have anything that they could do that, but now we do, so it's really nice. Or they could manually go in and do it if they want to, or their other option is they could use mass load to load that um, the years of experience as well. Um, my suggestion would be the mass change because that's the easiest and the quickest way to do it. <clears throat> and then if they wanted to, like we always say, they could run a report. They could run a report before and a report after if they wanted to do that to verify everybody got updated correctly. <clears throat> um, the next thing that the district can do or the ITC can help them do is um, records from the prior fiscal year compensation records will still have the report to EMIS flag marked as true. So they're going to have to go in and there's a mass change definition that can be used to basically change that flag fault, basically remove that from the 2020 compensation records. So I'm going to go back, go back to the core option, go to compensation. It takes a minute. Okay. And I want to go to the contract compensation tab in the middle. And then what districts are going to do is if they use the label field, if they put in like 1920 for the fiscal year, they could use that to filter the data. They could pull the data in that way. And that's kind of what um, we had recommended a while back. So hopefully your districts are doing that. It'll make it easy for them to actually go in and just pull that particular data in. So you can see here, I have one employee that I actually labeled for 19 and 20. And it's, by, it's Nick Schroeder. If I go into Nick's record, that EMIS field should be marked as true. If not, I'll go ahead and unmark it or mark it. So we can unmark it. All right, so I went ahead. And he's now he's marked as true for reportable to EMIS. All right, so what I'm going to do is use the mass change tab, the mass change definition, and I can go here and find my definition, which is EMIS equals false. And again, um, we may have this one out there. If we don't, I'll definitely make sure we put those out there and I will send you the link how you can get to them as well. I really apologize for that. So we have EMIS equals false. And I'm going to go ahead and execute this because I want to change those that flag or those flags if, if your district is changing multiple employees. I'm going to submit the mass change. And it told me that one record was updated. So if I go into Nick Schroeder's record now, the EMIS flag should be set to no. It should be set to false, which it is. It unchecks the reportable to EMIS field. That way, when they start doing the data collection for 21, they're not getting two records pulled in. They're not getting the record from 20 as well as 21 records. All right. Um, let's see what else we have. Oh, another thing that districts are going to want to do, if they use the, the uh, EMIS override fields, which are located on the position record, and we'll go ahead and look at those. And what I mean by override fields is 
Uh, they okay. They have compensation set up, and they have three compensation records set up. But they want to report only, you know, all three of them together, dollar amounts and one FP, et cetera. They they're going to go into the position record, and I'll show you where this field is at. It's right down here under this. Uh, this well, hold on here. The the staff employment. We have like reportable to EMIS, and we have all the position information, the appointment type. But over here we have uh, contract amount, contract work days, hours in the day. Then we have, you have the full time equivalency. All of these are the EMIS override fields. Okay. So if there's data in those fields, what happens is when the data collector does its, its collection, if there's data in these fields, it's going to pull this data over what's out in the compensation position right, or the, the compensation record. So it will pull this information in instead of anything from the compensation record. So if you have, if the district has information in here for 2020. They're going to want to make sure that that is cleared out because if they don't, it'll pull in for 2021. And what we can do to clear that information is go again, go back into the position record. And I think I have one, an employee already with data pulled in. Yeah, let me take a look at him. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. We will find out in one second here. <clears throat> Just tell her about the work All right. No? Yeah, he does. He has work days, hours and days. I'm going to put a contract amount on there too. And an FTE. Okay. I'm going to save that. So we're just going to do this one employee at the one position. I'm just going to clear those fields out. Um, let me filter it by his position as well. All right. So it's only his position one. Oh, I forgot to do equals one. Because there was 9-11. I'm <laughs> getting happy. There we go. Okay. So we're going to go ahead and do the mass change option. And under the low definition, we have a clear EMIS contract field. You can see that this is an SSDT created definition. So again, your district will be able to see that. And you can see here what we're going to be changing. So we're going to zero out the hours of the day, the contract amount, the contract work days. Now, if for some reason they don't want to remove the full-time equivalency, they could actually you could actually just take this off of the definition and save it. So I'm going to do this. I'm going to go in to the definition. Pardon? Hello? Oh, somebody must have just been on. Sorry. Okay. So now I'm going to I'm going to save. Well, this. I'm going to save. listen to the, the okay. Can you mute your phones? I'm I'm getting feedback. Can you can you mute your phone, please? <laughs> okay. So let me. Get rid of it. Oh, I can't get rid of it. Want, doesn't want me to get rid of it. I guess. Get out of there. Okay. There we go. That's what I wanted to do. So I'm going to save this definition. All right, I think. Oh, you know what? I can't because SSDT created it. Never mind. I'm sorry. <laughs> I it's already a, a created definition, so I can't do that. All right. So let's go back. Let me get rid of the error that I'm getting, which is nice because it told me I can't do that. I can't get rid of that. Definition. All right. So go back in and we'll do clear MIS SSDT option. I guess 
if you didn't want to remove the FTE, you're probably going to have to create your own <coughs> definition. <coughs> Excuse me. All right. So I should be able to go into the execution mode now and click on the submit change option. And then I should be able to go back in <coughs> to Trent Kelly's record and see that all of those EMIS overwrite fields have been removed, and they have. You can see everything is zeroed out. Now we're in depth. So everything's zeroed out because of that mass change definition. <coughs> um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else we need to talk about. Talk about that. Okay, I think that's everything I have. Um, as far as the EMIS uh, payroll connection, does anybody have questions? I know there's probably a lot of questions. EMIS always uh, brings, brings up several questions. So um, if you have any questions, feel free to ask them right now. That's fine. <clears throat> um, okay. Um, I will definitely go ahead and send everyone that link that I was looking for where we have um, a few mass uh, change definitions set. I will send that to you and I apologize I couldn't find it, um, but we will definitely do that. And if anybody thinks of anything later they have questions on, please feel free to let me know. And I appreciate everybody tuning in and have a great weekend. Lori, I have a question. Well, sure, yes. Okay, so I get a little confused with the contract, non-contract situation for supplemental people. So like you, maybe you have a music teacher that they have a supplemental contract for the play. What is the best way of reporting that? Should it be done as a contract or a non-contract? Let's say the, the, you know, the supplemental is only paid one time. I would say probably a non-contract. And how would That's you set would that say. up? Because I'm running into that if the day, like if you put in the unit amount as their full contract to be paid out, EMIS isn't liking mm -hmm. that because it's saying, you know, maybe they're getting paid $2,000 for the play. If you put in yeah. that $2,000 okay. in that unit amount, it's saying, whoa, 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 you know, that's way too much to be getting paid per day. Right, right. I follow what you're saying. And, and we were, like I talked about before, it does do a calculation on those non compensations. And that would be, <clears throat> excuse me, that would be a perfect example of what it's doing. And if EMIS isn't liking that, I'm trying to think. I mean, you could set it up as a compensation record, but it's, it's only, you're only paying it one time. Right, you're only right. paying you know, like two thousand dollars for one time, which in reality, I would think you would just want that to be a non non compensation, non contract compensation. But, I would agree, but I don't know how to get that to work yeah. with EMIS. Um, I'm trying to think how we could. Oh, you know what? I'm thinking. Okay, do you have do you have that? like supplemental position that is set up as a separate position record right right you could use the override field on the position record and pull that just two thousand dollars in that way because if there's data in there it's going to pull that it's not going to look at the compensation records okay so on the position record you would put in the contract it's amount like, of two thousand and it correct. won't look at the non-contract compensation. Correct, correct. It won't look at that because you already are overriding it with the position record. So that would probably be your best bet. That's my thinking just off the top of my head. I mean, unless I think of some other way, but like you said, because you're putting in $2,000, EMIS saying, huh, no, we're not doing that. That isn't good. We don't like that idea. But do they have, so you basically have it set up like one pay Unit amount two thousand dollars, right? For the non contract? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So they would just yeah. go in and add the miscellaneous or regular pay in the you know right. future and pull right. that in. Now I can see right. where our districts are not gonna like doing the non contract 
and then having to go back to the position screen to add that amount mm -hmm. because next year they may forget or not get updated yeah. correctly. So I don't yeah. foresee them liking that idea. They may want to do I, more of the comp I contract. I agree with you on that. Let me let me talk to Mark about that and see if there's some you know something we can do with you know working with on the EMIS portion of it to get that to work because in reality I mean you're only paying them one time you're giving them two thousand dollars so you know why not be able to use that as a unit amount in order to pull it in but right. I mean the workaround for now is what we just talked about the position record. Okay. Um, and I will talk to Mark about that and see if there's something that can be done, you know, so it doesn't uh, mess up or, you know, not, not accept it on the EMIS side. Mm -hmm. Okay. Sounds I can good. definitely do that. Okay. Sounds good. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Anybody else? Okay. I appreciate everybody tuning in and have a great weekend and we'll talk to you later. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody. Thanks, Lori. Thank you.